So this is a different part of our department have seen this. Oh yeah, thanks, got that. So as part of one of our courses, AP Math 698, uh, the students uh, practice on, on their research talks. This helps prepare them for the comprehensives coming up in the upcoming year. So I've been working hard, and so we'll hear some of those this week, some of those next week. So without further ado, I'm not taking any more of their time. They will introduce themselves, but we'll have our first speaker, Manny. Hello, everybody. Um, like or Gabe just said, I'm Maddie Keene. I'm in my second year in the APMS program here, and I'm working under Dr. Stephanie Hurst. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you all about my work on novel materials for electro-optical transduction within a quantum network. And so, real quick, I just want to give a real quick and dirty overview of what a quantum network is. So, just as we're thinking about our classical networks, um, with quantum networks, we now have some quantum devices introduced. And just as our classical computers use electronics, ones and zeros or bits, our quantum computers are gonna use qubits and for their ones and zeros. And those can be a number of different physical things, including ion traps, defects in solids, semiconductor quantum dots, superconducting qubits, as well as topological nanowires. Now, as you can imagine, since these are all physical systems, they're all operating in a range of different frequencies. So if we take superconducting qubits, for example, um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just gonna call them computing qubits. They're operating at a microwave frequency, maybe around 10 gigahertz, and they're easily manipulated by our existing uh, microwave technologies and hardwares. And they're really great for carrying out those heavy computations that you might think of when you think of quantum computing. And then we have things like defects in solids. This might be a nitrogen vacancy in diamond. And those are operating at around maybe 190 terahertz, so in that near infrared uh, area. And these communications are, these qubits <laughs> are really good for communication functions and sending information over a long distance. So I'll call them communications qubits for just this presentation. And then the overall goal of this quantum network is to have a reliable exchange of quantum information. And it's not to completely replace our classical network that we have today, um, but it's advantageous when it comes to encryption, secure communications, and long baseline interferometry. One challenge currently, however, is how do we get this information to send over a long distance in a network without losing it? And one of the main problems is, is that those computing qubits at those microwave frequencies are not effective for those long distance transmissions. And those communication qubits are not as good for the heavy computations that we think of when we think of quantum computing. Um, and so just to put some numbers to that, if you were to send a microwave qubit or a qubit at a microwave frequency, sorry, over an optical fiber, um, you would see over one decibel uh, per meter of loss in your signal intensity compared to an optical qubit at the, on the same optical fiber, you're gonna see less than 0.2 decibels per meter of loss in your signal intensity. And now while that's only 0.8 on the surface, we do have to remember that decibels is a logarithmic scale of power in milliwatts. So it is quite actually a big difference. Um, but yeah. And so one solution to this is frequency switching or microwave to optical uh, photons transduction. And the way that we can do that is by utilizing materials with a second order nonlinear susceptibility or chi-square. Um, these materials have the capability of doing up and down conversion, um, looking first at this down conversion or difference frequency generation. Um, some of you may even know it as parametric down conversion. This is a spontaneous process that happens in these chi-squared materials um, where an incoming frequency hits this chi-squared material, splits into two new ones. In the case of what we're talking about here, uh, you would get some excess microwave frequency and a redshifted sideband optical photon. Um, one drawback to this, you might think, is this extra microwave signal. It does translate as noise into the system. 
um, and it could potentially dampen your uh, total photon conversion efficiency. So um, there's another process that we can make happen within these chi-squared materials called some frequency generation, where we still have our incoming, whatever our incoming signal is, and then some tuned optical pump laser that's going to hit this material at the same time as your incoming frequency. They're going to combine and they're going to give you some blue shifted sideband. Uh, so this is an anti stokes process. And so just to give you an idea of what these circuits might look like to do this type of transduction, here in 2006, from the Rueda group, um, they took an optical lithium niobate whispering gallery mode resonator and tucked it inside of a super, or, or sorry, a microwave resonant copper cavity. And it's this lithium niobate resonator that is actually doing that up and down conversion that we just talked about. And to assess kind of the success of the circuits, they looked at the total photon conversion efficiency, new, uh, the quality factor of the resonators, as well as the bandwidth. And they found that they had a 0.001% of total photons converted. So not great, but they did it. Um, and they had quality factors on the order of 10 to the fifth, even down to cryogenic temperatures, which is gonna be necessary if we can't figure out how to get these quantum devices to operate at room temperature. And their bandwidth um, was really high um, for something like this at one megahertz. Um, ideally it would be higher, but you are limited with your bandwidth for your mechanical resonant modes of your system. And so in 2018, this fan group, they took a little bit of a different approach. They used aluminum nitride, and made this coplanar superconductive um, cavity. And so you can imagine there's some line right down the middle here uh, that's separating the microwave resonances from the optical resonances. And there is actually a thin material that's transparent and superconductive to prevent any crossover between those two modes. And they found, um, they upped the, their total photon conversion efficiency to 2%, uh, their quality factors were on the order of 2 million, even down to cryogenic temperatures. And, but their bandwidth uh, dropped down to about 0.6. So you can see maybe right now the struggle of we want to increase this total photon conversion efficiency, but we still want to keep a high Q in bandwidth. And so we can go to looking at the materials and maybe making some changes there. And so we're thinking about uh, materials for these resonators, we need to, they need to have a high second order nonlinear susceptibility, chi squared. If it doesn't, those up and down conversion processes are not going to happen. It also needs to be transparent in our relevant telecom wavelengths. If it's not, photons are going to get absorbed, uh, quasi particles are going to be generated, and the quality of your circuit is going to plummet a lot. Um, also, if these materials are superconductive, we can do cool geometries, um, like we just saw with that coplanar superconducting cavity. And some examples of these materials might include lithium niobate, um, aluminum nitride, like we just saw, um, as well as indium tin oxide, which is where our work focuses. And for those of you that are familiar with ITO, you might be like, okay, well, it doesn't superconduct. So you're already not meeting one of these three things you're trying to hit. Um, and you're right, but um, it can be made superconductive. And this is where our work from our MIT collaborators comes in. Uh, we work closely with Dr. Carl Bergeron and his PhD student, Emma Batson. And they've shown that you can take commercially available ITO, expose it to a three chemical electro cell, excuse me, uh, like shown here on the bottom left of this slide, and um, reduce it to an appropriate charge carrier concentration so that it will superconduct. So if we look at this slide here on the right, it actually has a thin layer of ITO all over it, and this brown part is what has been exposed to our sodium fluoride solution in the electrochemical cell. And so we went the next step further, just to confirm that these do superconduct um, using a liquid helium cryostat. Um, we took four point uh, resistant measurements on the film films as we lowered the temperature down to 300 millikelvin. 
And we found that they found that um, a commercial ITO slide right out of the box is going to be these black lines right here. And as that temperature decreases, there's no change in the resistivity. But if we look over here at this gradient of brown on the plots, um, those are all slides that have been reduced um, to an appropriate charge carrier concentration. And we see a big drop off around three to four Kelvin um, where these films hit a zero resistance, exactly like you would expect to see for a superconductive material. One problem with this though, is that the surface is incredibly rough. And this should be due to the forceful introduction of these new charge carriers. Um, all those defects are just rising up to the surface, leaving us with this terrible nanoparticle. <laughs> um, which if we're gonna use these materials for an optical circuit, you can imagine that's gonna introduce a lot of scatter and it's not gonna be ideal. So that's where my work comes in. And I have been working on a spin coating method for creating these superconductive ITO thin, thin films. And so far the process is making solutions all with the same concentration of indium. And then um, vary the tin concentration. Right now we're making one solutions with zero, five, 10, and 15% tin. Um, and the idea and hope is, is that we're starting with this higher carrier concentration from the start, right? These films, you might notice they're brown. They're not like this nice clear one here. Um, they look more like the reduced form already. Um, so hopefully we'll avoid that really bad nanoparticle layer. <laughs> um, and so, so far the way that we're making these, we're taking those solutions, dropping a little bit onto a glass slide and spinning them for about a minute. And then once we spin one layer, we'll do what we call an air bake at 125 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes, ramp up the temperature to 400 degrees Celsius, let's sit for another 10. And then we'll keep repeating those spin and air bake processes until we get a film with the thickness that we want. And once we get there, we'll do a hydrogen argon annealing just to make it productive. Um, and Talk a little bit more about that because when we first did this, um, we had found this work from 2013 from Chen and coworkers, where they only did this hydrogen argon annealing for three hours. And after I did that for three hours, I found that my films had a resistance and like hundreds of kilo ohms. So way higher than I was expecting to find. And so I was like, I don't really know what to do. Um, so I just let him sit in there for longer and pulled him out every hour and checked the resistance to see how they changed. And I found at around five hours, we have this huge drop off in resistance. Also, as you go um, and yield them for longer, the resistance between samples becomes more consistent as well. So now we just, every time we do this, it's a 16 hour overnight. Annealing. And once we figured out that, we then went to go on to look at how the thickness of these ITO films uh, affects the resistivity and found something similar, that as we increase the thickness of our films, so as we go from one, two, three, four, um, our resistance is going down and it's more consistent between samples. Uh, so the next step for this is going to be characterizing them uh, via AFM um, and electron microscopy techniques, as well as ellipsometry to characterize their optical um, characteristics, making sure they're transparent where we need them to be, and that they actually superconduct. <laughs> so moving on to um, if ITO ever you know, runs out, some other materials that we are interested in are these organic electro-optical molecules. Um, due to their three-part structure of this electron donor, high conjugated bridge, and electron acceptor, they have this first order hyperpolarizability or beta um, by themselves. They have this high second order nonlinear optical susceptibility when they're together in the bulk, um, so that high squared. And they're also transparent where we need them to be. And another really cool part about this is that it's a molecular system and it's easily um, modified. 
And so we can kind of change these R groups to reach those chi-squared values that maybe that we're looking for. Um, and then just to wrap it all up, um, what I just talked to you all about, uh, to have a successful quantum network, we're going to need to be able to do microwave to optical frequency transduction. And the way to do that is through the use of these chi-squared materials like ITO. And um, I specifically talked about an electro-optical mediated approach. Um, this can be done in a number of different ways. Um, in time, just have time to talk about it. As well as this electro-optical approach um, has advantages for other forms of quantum logic. Um, so I think it's a promising path to keep going. And then I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Stephanie Hurst, and our MIT collaborators, Dr. Carl Bergeron and his PhD student, Emma Batson, as well as NSF and the Center for Quantum Networks for Quantum Thank you. Okay. We have time for one or two questions. First hand over here, Joel. <laughs> um, do you have any idea of the thickness of the layers? Um, yeah, so with the Four the four layers, um, I would assume it's maybe about 180 nanometers thick to 200, um, just based off of that paper that I had talked about here, because that's what they want. We haven't actually measured the thickness of our films yet, though. Is there a thickness that you're looking for? Um, Beyond, you know, the you know, be able to gather and kind of possible. Signal from that yeah, that's really kind of what we're looking for. And that's what this experiment was kind of getting at. Um, I think we think we're going to be happy with four to five layers, um, but we'll just have to do more characterization to see. I, yeah. I think I, I must have missed something really fun. So when you were talking about these ideal kaiju material to set both transparent in the infrared and superconducting. So those two properties I would think are kind of uh, one you could have one or the other, I would think. Yeah. Um, and that is typically your superconducting materials are not transparent, I feel like. So you're right, it is kind of a counterintuitive thing, but we have these materials like ITO that are both transparent and superconducting. So you can only have one. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a matter of finding material that has one. <laughs> awesome. Great. Let's thank you again. We're going to move to the key moments. We're going to get ready as we get ready here. Just entertain yourselves. Good job, Maddie. Yeah, minimize here or even close. Yeah, just close that one. And then you're yeah. down here, right? Yeah. Where are you? Right here, right? Okay, let's get you. All right, we should be all good to go. Be all set. Yeah. Oh, so this is our next speaker, Eva. Okay. And that concludes my talk. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, you all know me. I'm Eva. I'm with the Department of uh, Physics and Material Science. And today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, magnetic maze design for catalytic microswimmers. Um, but before I get into it, I want to give some acknowledgments to yeah, Dr. Gibbs, uh, John Castaneda, who did like most of the work on this project, uh, Gabe, who organized all this for us, and all you guys still are getting the knowledge too. Okay, so uh, in the title, you heard me say the word microsomers, but before we talk about what microsomers are, we have to talk about Janus materials, and Janus materials are called Janus materials because they're named after this guy, Janus. He is the god, he's a Roman god, and he has two faces. So when you think of a Janus material, you just think of anything that has two faces that are different either chemically or physically. And you can see we can have all these weird geometries. Typically, they're like small particles, uh, these Janus materials. So we have all these weird geometries. But what we want to do for our microswimmers is make a sphere. And I'll explain how to do that. Um, so we want it to be biphasic, like I just said, we want it to have two different faces, like Janus, the Roman god. So what we're going to do is through the process of physical vapor deposition, we're going to take our spherical seed particles 
and they kind of get embedded or when they're really close together on the substrate, they kind of touch each other so that when we deposit our metal vapor on top of them, only the top half gets covered. And that's how we get this biphasic structure like this. That's what we want. And that's how we get it. Uh, and we end up with these, these two part, these particles with uh, a face that has a metal on one side and a basically just bare silicon dioxide on the other side. And so we actually layer it twice. So we have um, a paramagnetic alloy layer, which I'll explain why. But the more important almost layer is the catalytic titanium surface. So the reason they're called catalytic microswimmers is because they have this catalysis reaction happening at their surface that propels them forward. So we have their fuel, which is hydrogen peroxide, and it decomposes into uh, H2O and O2. At this surface, this titanium metal basically just catalyzes this reaction and causes this, this whole thing to move in this direction away from the reaction that's happening. So we have our particle, we have our catalysis, it's con consuming this fuel and it's propelling itself in this direction. And uh, so let's talk about this layer in the middle here, this uh, platinum iron layer. Uh, so we, we can, see that the particles are going to move when we put them in the solution with the hydrogen peroxide, but how else can we get them to interact with their environment? So with this layer, this magnetic layer in the middle, we basically create these offset magnetic dipole moments in each of these particles. So um, if you consider this scenario that we're looking at right here, we have uh, so this layer here is the catalytic surface on each one of these. So they're propelling each other they're propelling towards each other. However, their dipole moments are gonna to wanna to orient away from each other because they don't wanna be that close because they're magnetic dipoles and they don't like that. So we can kind of see all these weird interactions that are gonna happen as we have a lot of particles in our system that are propelling each other as well as interacting with each other through this magnetic dipole moment. Uh, okay, and here's just some images of what I just explained. So. Here is the part, of, this kind of shows the particles being embedded on the substrate so that when we deposit that layer on top, we will cover the first half or the top half. And then here you can see on this SEM image, the edge, like, I don't know if you guys can see that, but there's an edge here that shows you the different halves of it. And then this is that edge highlighted in green. Um, I stole this from a paper, but I did not write. And okay, so that was just what I wanted to show you, the structure of these particles. Uh, and how they look under the SEM. Um, video, where did it go? <laughs> there it is. Uh, okay, so this is a, before I play this video, this is just an example of what the microswimmers do. These ones are responsive to UV light. So this catalysis that's happening at the surface is now being, uh, I don't know, like driven by the UV light. So these, you'll see, oh, the movie may not come through. It'll probably have to put it on the air gas. I don't know. Look at that. It might not even work. Let's see. Okay. Oh, <laughs> good. No. It won't. Okay. Well, in your imaginations, <laughs> imagine that you're seeing a system of all these particles <laughs> and the light will turn on or the light will be off and then we'll turn the UV light on and they start moving a lot. I think it may be because it got converted from a Google. Yeah. Oh, so okay. just use your imaginations on this one, that you're seeing the particles swimming around and it's really cool and exciting. And it makes you really excited. Okay, so that was that. Okay, so why am I talking about this at all in the first place? Well, it turns out these James materials and microswimmers have a lot of different applications. You can use them for targeted drug delivery if you attach drugs to the particles themselves and they swim around to different locations in the body. Um, they can do that. You can also create biohybrids. Basically, this paper talks about uh, they constructed these nanostructures and bacteria basically uptake them and they tell the bacteria what to do now that they have all these artificial parts to them. Uh, and then I included this picture of Iron Man because I think when people think of like microswimmers or nano robotics in general, they think of the Iron Man suit. Also, somebody told me that movie Big Hero 6 with all the nanobots that like fly out like that. So that's great. We're going to do that someday. Um, but what are we missing? Why can't we do that right now? Uh, what are we, what's going on that we can't control these particles? So they are very difficult to control their precise motion the same way every time. So you can imagine that a system of thousands of nanoparticles 
in a solution, it's very difficult to dictate each individual particle's motion the exact same way every time. So you run into these uh, issues of reproducibility and scalability, which kind of begs the question, how can these particles be made more autonomously? How can we remove ourselves from this equation and program them so that they do what we want them to do without our intervention? Um, so some other works that have been done on this already have used these local chemical environmental changes. So they set up this maze with a pH gradient and like the particle follows this path with the along this gradient and it solves the maze and then they can extract the different particle velocities like this. Um, but again, this is a rudimentary setup and it also is difficult to reproduce. So how can we improve upon this? Um, so I had this idea of creating, again, this maze, like we just saw, they have this maze, but instead of using chemical changes, we can use changes to the physical environment, uh, particularly taking advantage of our particles that have that offset dynamic dipole moment. Um, so we're going to put them in this maze full of physical objects, objects that are uh, caused by the distortion of the local magnetic field. And we're going to do this, I'll just explain to you how we make this maze. We do this with, uh, again, physical vapor deposition, but we add this thing called a shadow mask. It's basically like a stencil. You deposit your metal um, onto this stencil and you take away the stencil and you're left with a pattern. Just that, um, like spray, you're like spraying it on and then you take away the stencil and you're left with this pattern. So uh, this is what it looks like on the microscope slide. So we just took a glass slide and we deposited some nickel on it. And it's kind of hard to tell the different sizes but here, you, I tried to blow it up so you can see these different patterns. So we have some circular geometries, we have some square geometries, we have all these different ranges of sizes, and I know you can see all the sizes because they're really small pixels, but uh, there's some really tiny patches of magnetic material there that are going to cause these distortions in the local magnetic field. Um, okay, and this picture here is what I kind of use for my diagram. So just imagine that these blue squares correspond to these like silver squares. These are all nickel patches and they're all magnetic. And this is the microscope slide. Okay. So when we have a field like this on the left, right side, um, it's all straight lines. It's not going to be distorted. But when we add these nickel patches, you can see they kind of distort the local magnetic field because nickel is a ferromagnetic material and it has its own magnetic field. And so, um, so like I talked about the two particles interacting with each other, they're propelling towards each other, but then they want to orient away. Something similar we expect to happen as this particle here is going to um, interact with these different magnetic objects. Uh, it's propelling in one direction, but it wants to orient in another direction so that it's in its lowest energy configuration so that it's not, uh, it's trying to orient away from the magnetic field basically because that's how magnets work. So we have our highly distorted magnetic field from our maze, our maze that we created. Then we're gonna have dipole-dipole repulsion between the particles and the magnetic obstacles themselves. And then we're gonna have this competing motion. The catalytic surface wants to push it in one direction and the rotation of the magnetic dipole moment wants it to go in another direction. So we should expect to see some cool interactions between the particles and the environment um, that we have designed. Um, and I swear this is a video, but nothing's happening in it, so you can't really tell. So I've just highlighted, uh, see that one's moving a little bit. So I just highlighted, this is just looking down through a microscope, uh, what this might look like. So here's some micro swimmers um, themselves, kind of jiggling around, doing their thing. And then here is the edge. Uh, you can see them between two of these large, larger square patches um, that were left behind when we did the shadow masking deposition. Uh, and yeah, it's really hard to tell what's going on here because they're not really moving. They're not, they don't appear to be propelling and they don't appear to be interacting with each other or the environment. Uh, and here's something, here's another video kind of showing the circular geometry. This one moves a little bit more. You can kind of see them jiggling up here, uh, these big agglomerations of them. Not really sure what that's about, but there's some single ones. They're also not really doing much. And I'll just let this video play because it'll show you kind of what the geometry of the maze will look like as it moves around. It's just me like scrolling around trying to see if any of the particles are moving. Um, but yeah, so we have these like big patches of magnetic material and we're hoping that 
something will happen. <laughs> but in this video, nothing really does. Okay. So some conclusions that we can draw um, from this video alone is that the microswimmers should interact with their environment and this distorted local field through their dipole moments. But why are they not moving? Not sure. It could be a number of things. It could be the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide fuel we used was not enough, not high enough. Um, they might also be confined too strongly by the field. So the magnetic patches might be so large that the particles can't move at all. Um, but we don't know how that's future work. Uh, we still hope to show that changing the geometry of the obstacles will change the motion of the micro swimmers. So hopefully we can design our uh, shadow mask pattern to be a specific shape so that we can get them to go in a specific motion. But first we need them to propel in the first place. And right now they are not. So we have to address these problems before we can move on. Um, and some future work, like I just mentioned, uh, would be some more complex geometries, maybe some 3D navigation uh, that has huge applications for inside the human body. I included this picture of this like cool 3D printed maze. You can't really 3D print like magnetic metals, but you can figure it out. Okay, thank you. That's my time. And what else right you to get down here? I, I'm just curious, do you have to do anything to the nickel, like anneal it to make sure you actually get a, a macroscopic magnetic domain? We haven't. I don't know. I think it should just do that. Uh, like when you deposit it as a thin film, it should still just be magnetic, but I'm not sure. That's an interesting question. Two more. So we'll go to the back. Um, a question about the last video that you showed with the magnets. Uh, is there any capability of being able to use something that you could like turn on and off that magnetic effect to see if there's any kind of change? It, like I would imagine seeing some kind of grounding motion. Is that something that's kind of not very realistic for the setup? Like how can you can say you turn on? So we can, so you couldn't really do something like that, like you would have to remove the particles from this substrate that they're on, but you can turn on and off the applied external field. So uh, I think the only thing that having the external field will do will be orient the dipole moments of the particles in one direction in the beginning initially, and you can turn that on and off. But again, just because like, I don't really know how they're interacting with the surface, it's hard to say um, if that video that had worked, you would see the difference between the Brownian motion and the, the like self-propelling with the UV light. And so, um, yeah, it's hard to tell. And it's hard to say whether that would work in this system or not, just because these results are kind of showing. <laughs> Good question, thank you. And one more. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> awesome presentation, Eva, thank you. Uh, so to address the issues that you're talking about, what are some of your thoughts on like, how you plan on like, your plan of action to, to go through? Is, is it to like simplify your like your main? Is it actually just like a, like a sim simple like sort of like hallway or column, like, and then put your students in there, or you just kind of go back to the physics and figure out it? I think right. the issue, I think the issue may be the particles themselves are missing some key thing, maybe the thickness of the catalytic layer or something, I'm not quite sure. It would have to do, I think, more so with the particles themselves rather than placing them in this environment. Um, like I said, with the applied external magnetic field that might be confining them too strongly, I don't think it's that. I think it's something to do with how they're consuming the fuel. So I'd have to look at how the particles are consuming the fuel, how they're interacting that way. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Okay, so that was the last. We could, uh, <laughs> last, last. What concentration uh, hydrogen peroxide are you using? Uh, should be 30%. Um, it's very, it's pretty high concentration, but I was using 30% for this experiment and it didn't make them move. So I'm not quite sure if I want to use higher or not, but. Is it idea mostly the hydrogen peroxide provides the, you know, cross force and the magnetic field that provides the direction? Yes, yeah, something like that. Yeah, that would be that. But like I said, it's hard to tell what they're doing because they're not propelling. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, yeah, I know. I don't know. All right. Well, thank you very much again. All right.
Okay, so we got a Londra coming down. We'll get this ready. Oops, let me stop this if I can. Yeah, let's see that right here. Let's see if I can come down and then we'll turn it on. Ah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, I'll turn it on. Now it should be live. Yeah, it's just, there you go. Yeah. All right, folks, well, we're getting set up here. So the flyer live, we will not be done by five, but we'll get close to that. We have four talks today, two more to go. Um, is that working? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. And so so Londra is going to be giving our next talk. So here we go. And one thing I love about this, and I know you all know this, but you can see the breadth of the research in our, in our, in our team, which is really amazing. All right, so welcome Alondra. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Again, um, I'm going to present my research project. Uh, it's called Salivary Salic Acid as a Biomarker for Disease Screening Using Nanotechnology in case you're lovely and my longer than the senior. And my advisor is Professor Miguel Cosina. So let's begin. This is a big picture of the entire project, and it's divided into three main parts. The first part, we found a biomarker called salic acid in saliva, but don't worry, I'm going to explain obviously what is salic acid. And the main goal was diseases screening. For the second part, we use saliva and nanostructures, in this case, silver nanoparticles. And for the last part, we use a technique called surface enhanced random scattering cells. I just want that all of you remember these five words highlighted in red. And let's begin with the first one, salic acid. Oxalic acid is really cool as a biomarker. So we found that increased levels of oxalic acid are pervasive in cancer and are related to a mechanism called hypersolation. So how can you understand hypersolation? Let's look at this normal cell. The normal cell has normal solution. It means a specific amount of uh, salic acid. You can see the salic acid here are the purple dots onto the surface of the cell. Now, what happens if this normal cell transforms to a cancerous cell? Now we have a hypersolation. It means a higher concentration of cyanic acid. As you can see, more purple dots, okay? So this hypersolation is related to increase in tumor metastasis and increase in cancer cell survival. Just a reminder, a higher concentration of cyanic acid, a higher probability of having cancer, okay? So the next question is, where can sialic acid be found? But before I answer this question, because I really wanted to answer this question, obviously, um, I just want to say something that is this uh, chemical formula, n acetylbromic acid, NU5AC, is just, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to say this is just sialic acid, okay? Just remind me, remind me. So this one is a mass abundant, um, and you can find this one in every human foods like sweat, urine, blood, and saliva. But we choose saliva because it's easy to collect, store, and transport. This makes saliva a potentially valuable fluid for the diagnosis. Now, I just wanted to show you this huge timeline. So salic acid is present in inflammatory diseases because and inflammation is basically an overexpression of salic acid. So we start maybe before 2016, but um, we started to study breast cancer and sorry, <laughs> breast cancer and ovarian cancer. We published that. Also, periodontitis that is an inflammation of the gut, and that's a core T, in case you don't know. And in 2018 to 2019, we started cervical cancer. I'm going to talk about only cervical cancer. And then last year, part of, yeah, last year, part of this year, we started preeclampsia. In case you don't know, it's a hypertension disorder that can occur during pregnancy. So this all is the first part of the project. And the second part of the project and part of our future goals are continue to study preeclampsia and cervical cancer and also heart diseases. So let's look at only on cervical cancer because I have 
not trying to explain all of this. Okay. Oh, also, we published uh, a paper on pre class in case you want to read it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> Okay, how can you understand the importance of studies of the full cancer? We need to look at the statistics. So this is the global gynecological cancer incidence and mortality, as you can see. Mortality is a dark blue, incidence is a light blue. As you can see, cervical cancer is the most diseases uh, type of cancer among these types of cancer. So I just want to say something that survival is strongly related to the stage of diagnosis. So that's why it's so, so important and very to touch your neck, just remind that again. <laughs> so what are the current screening tests available in the marker for cervical cancer? There are mainly four, HPV DNA test, visual inspection with acetic acid, liquid based cytology, and pap smear. They obviously have advantages and disadvantages as you can read here, but let's focus only on pap smear because pap smear is the most used globally, it's the most famous, um, and also pap smear has its advantages, like requires time to see results and the subjectiveness and analysis. But the most important one, pap smear has low sensitivity and low specificity. And maybe you're wondering, okay, Alondra, but what is sensitivity and what, what is specificity? Okay, sensitivity is the ability of the screening test to detect a true positive. True positive is a person with a disease, in this case, cervical cancer. In specificity, as you can see here, is the ability of screening test to detect a true negative. It's a healthy person. So as you can see, this is a sad face, a person with cancer, and a smiley face, a healthy person, okay? So in 2015, Baruch and co-workers published uh, the percentage of sensitivity and specificity for cervical cancer, in this case, sorry, for pap smear. And it was at 57% for pap smear sensitivity and 76% for specificity for pap smear, okay, which is really low, okay? So our goal is increase sensitivity and specificity percentage. Okay, but well how can we do this? So this is our methodology. On the first part, we collect saliva samples. We request a uh, sign for concern from patients and also request the patients brush their teeth and use a mouth wash. And for the second part, we centrifugate saliva for 10 minutes and then we synthesize nanostructures, in this case, silver nanoparticles. And we make saliva and so many particles. And for the last part, we use uh, this equipment. It's a Raman spectroscopy and the technique that I mentioned before. So let's focus on the technique because the technique is really important in this part of the project. So how can we understand surface and Haynes Raman scattering? So we need to look at the differences between traditional Raman spectroscopy, that is the left part, yeah. And the right part is to uh, search. Okay, so for this part, uh, for Raman spectroscopy, we need an excitation light. This excitation light is basically a laser, and this laser shine on the analyte. And then part of the scattering light, um, sorry, uh, before that, the analyte um, absorbs the energy and then starts to vibrate. The vi vibrates. Maybe it's something like dancing, and then. Um, Part of the scattering light, the most of the part, if it's elastic, it's what we call Rayleigh, and if it's inelastic, it's what we call Raman scattering. But the most disadvantage, sorry, one disadvantage of this technique is you can analyze analytical concentrations greater than 0 0.0 0 molar. Now, what happened with SIRS? We have the same excitation light, but now we have a different thing that is an analyte of sort on a nanostructure surface. Okay, so now we have this complex between the analyte and the nanostructure. So we able to enhance the, the Raman signal just for having this. But how this mechanism occur? Basically, we have what we call localized surface plasma resonance. And when you have this LSER occurs, is when the light frequency matches the oscillation frequency of the electrons that enhance an electrical field 
near to the surface of the particle, as you can see here. So basically, we have two mechanisms. One is the electromagnetic, and it contributes 10 to the 10. That's what I said before. It's what we call hot spots. And the other one is chemical, and it's basically the, the chemical bonds between the nanostructure and the, and the molecule. So now the biggest advantage for SARS is basically now you can analyze lower concentrations up to 10 to the minus 9 molar. Okay. So how it looks in real life. So basically it's this one, Raman and SARS um, spectra of silver nanoparticles and sialic acid. As you can see, the black solid line is the sialic acid. And the red solid line is salic acid, but now it has silver nanoparticles. So as you can see, we're able to enhance the Raman signal. Ooh. And as you can see here, the uh, blue dotted line is basically the assignments uh, for the vibrational modes of salic acid. So we obtained 907, 1174, and 1369. And here in the table, we have the assignments uh, related to the bonds of the sialic acid. And this is the chemical structure in case you don't remember for the first slides. Okay, now how we synthesize silver nanoparticles, we follow this method. It's called turkivage, and it's really old, but I think it's really effective. So we mix silver nitrate at this concentration, and then we mix, sorry, sorry we added sodium citrate at the same concentration. And then after we reach the boiling point um, under a spin, the color changed from transparent and then yellow, brown, grayish green. And then we made a filtration process and washing process and voila, we have this silver so nanoparticles. okay? Now, what about the results? So we have started uh, two, two groups. The first group, was made by low regulations, CIN1, that is this one. This is just a plot of the distribution of sialic acid concentrations. And we studied 30 patients for the first group and 20 patients for the second group. For the second, oh, sorry, for the second group uh, was confirmed by high regulations, that is CIN2 and 3 and cervical cancer. As you can see here, this is the sialic acid concentration in milligram per deciliter in saliva. So the first result is mean and the second one is standard deviation. As you can see for the first group, we obtained 14 and for the second group, we obtained a higher concentration of sialic acid, which means this group has a higher probability of having cancer, in this case, the cervical cancer, okay? But what about if we compare our results versus Favismir? Because Favismir is a golden standard for this type of cancer. So maybe you don't remember anything about sensitivity and specificity. So I added this table in case you don't remember anything. So this is a specificity, sensitivity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value. So um, the black ones are Favismir and the red ones are are test, sialic acid in saliva. So as you can see, this is the sad phase related to a person with cancer. So we obtained a 93% versus 76% uh, belongs to pop smear. Okay, so we improved that percentage of specificity and also sensitivity. Now, how can you understand positive predictive value and negative predictive value? Do we still have time? Okay, so let's look at this table. So this is PPV and NPV. So how can you understand PPV? So this is a person who got a positive for the test result, but is healthy. So basically it's a false positive. So we obtain 80% unfortunately <laughs> versus 92% for past year. And for the last one, it's this one. MPV. So it's a person who got negative for the result, but is sick. So has um, the cervical cancer in this case. So now we improve the percentage of 87% versus 26%. So in summary, we improve specificity, sensitivity, and negative predictive value versus past year. Okay. So now I just want to overview close your eyes. 
and you imagine that you are a woman, or maybe you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> this woman goes to a hospital or pharmacy and then buys a salivary salic acid test. And it's affordable because the price is maybe in 10 bucks. And then she makes the saliva and the serous substrate and then leaves this sample in a mobile clinic. And then inside this mobile clinic, it's a portable Raman spectroscopy equipment. And then the results, um, she gets the results in less than 10 minutes because it's a rapid test. And finally, she'll receive an envelope that says, your concentration of salic acid is that, that, that. This is this is a dream that we have, but maybe maybe it will happen. Okay, so the advantages are many, like it's affordable, you can get fast results, it's reproducible, it's safe because you, you don't have to deal with blood and can be performed in real time. Okay, now let's look again at the timeline. So I just want to highlight something that in this part, the first part we use, sorry. We use silver nanoparticles, and for the second part in our future goals is uh, study uh, new populations uh, that is Native Americans, and also uh, study a new serous substrate made of silver nanowires. So I just want to present really quickly about our preliminary results on silver nanowires. So the goal was improve our serous substrate, and the problem was. <laughs> The oxidation of silver through time. So, how can we solve this? So, we created a silver nanowire. As so you can see here, this is a TAM image of silver nanowire. But onto that, we put a nickel coating in order to avoid oxidation, as you can see here. And here is the EDS image. So, as you can see, maybe you can see, but the red dots are nickel and the green ones are silver. As you can see, we're able to uh, create a coating to protect all silver, nan silver nanowire. And here is just uh, the Raman research spectra of silver nanowires uh, with nickel coating and sialic acid. As you can see, the black solid line is just basically sialic acid. And the daughter red line is um, silver nanowires plus sialic acid. As you can see, we're able to enhance the round the signal again. And now the conclusions. So this test can be implemented as, as an additional tool in a reliable and effective screening. Um, it's a novel incorporation of this technique and can be produced by nanostructure. It's affordable, it's a rapid test, it's reproducible, safe, and can be performed in real time. And the most important thing, it's an early detection method. I would like to thank uh, my former lab, Dr. Hugo Navarro Contreras, Aida Hernandez Actiada, my new lab, and of course my advisor, Dr. Miguel Jose Yacaman, Dr. Jesus Velasquez, and Alex Ler, and obviously my, my Mira Familia. And also, last but not least, my mom, who's here in the audience. Thanks, mom. <laughs> That's all. Thank you so much. All right, we have time for questions. Yeah, John. Yeah, I was wondering uh, for the one of your last slides, you have the nickel coating on the silver. Oh, okay. uh, does that affect the, the surface resonances? Uh, no, we wanted to um, avoid oxidation. So um, that's why I put the around in the spectra in order to show you that we able to enhance, even though we have. Uh, um, so, sialic acid is a family of compounds. I assume you don't care which one you detect? Yeah, it's, it's what I said that in this case. I... You're just looking for that new ac 5 Sorry, what, what was that? You're just looking for the new ac 5 or are you just looking at sialic acids generally? No, so just, just, just for this one, because I know that it's another type of sialic acid that it's related to like like yeah. different but yeah just for now just this one okay and second question mm -hmm. uh you show the difference between the small small lesions and large lesions but what's the concentration in the control population which is not cancerous for us the control population was the first group okay so yeah. you don't have a, a non-cancerous control group 
And no, we don't need that group. Maybe we can do that. Yeah. Just control. Yeah. Yeah. So if we don't have to answer it all, because gingivitis is a common inflammatory disease in the mouth, which is why you're having the brush the teeth. Yeah. That might be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Know that you enhance the ramen with the nanoparticles, but how did they like compare to each other? Was there uh, an advantage or disadvantage when using those nanoparticles compared to the waters? Okay, I'm, I'm not at that point. <laughs> it probably would be in, uh, in a near future, but yeah, the only thing that we wanted to do is just improve the um Raman signal. So for this, which is work, we compare. Okay. So we have this results from silver uh nanoparticles versus silver nanowars. So we wanted to know the difference between okay, is this better to use nanowars or just silver nanoparticles? And what were the size of guys Okay, um, the solar nanoparticles are around maybe less than 100 nanometers, and the silver nanowires, um, the length, it's around um, maybe 160 nanometers, okay. and a little bit longer. Thank you. All right, let's thank you, Lundra, one more time. And we have one more, folks. There we go. And while we're setting up here, I'm going to recognize our newest doctor in the house, Dr. Maria Fuller Gostany, who's here. We have a chance to congratulate you. Recently defended her PhD. Congratulations. All right. So, Philip is going to give us our last talk today. And then again, we'll be here next week, folks. Thanks for being here. I'm presenting on Sagrada Advising in Hybrid Care and Nanotech Practice and after the Pasari Recovery Talk and Gifts. So, to understand the whole topic I introduced earlier, I'll talk about car practice. So, pick up your hand and then you lay on the back like that. Yes. <laughs> the advanced, or they don't superimpose on each other. So, now makes them care up. And for a car object like this bottle, the mirror images for the rotation, if you lay it on the other, they can be superimposed to make it, making them a car. So they are commonly found in household items like the golf club, the scissors, your shoe, coach screw, and also commonly found in biological items like see this carbohydrate over here and this amino acid. We take them or we take the mirror images and we superimpose them on each other. They, they, they cannot be superimposed like this one. Then I have a circular diaphragm. So talk about circular diaphragm. I want to understand what diaphragm is. So when you put light on a material, they are thought differently. And that phenomenon is called circular, it's called diaphragm. So to add circular diaphragm means you are using circularly polarized light, then they are absorbing differently. So like the left hand and the right hand, they are absorbing the light differently. So when circularly polarized light passes through an optically active medium, these three things happen. The speed between the right and left polar polarization differ. The wavelengths differ. In the extension, they absorb, absorb the different enantiomers differ. The enantiomers are again at the left and then the right. The circular diaphragm is the difference between the left and then the right absorption. So here you see right-handed light and then the left-handed light. More on this. So when the material, when this light is superimposed to the material, we expect that the results and then they will come out linear, but because they have different absorption for the left and the right hand, they come out elliptical. And that absorption, that elliptical relationship over here is based on the absorption of the material and then the extension coefficient, the length and the concentration. And this relation gives us the ellipticity in degrees. So the plot of the ellipticity and the wavelength gives us the circular diaphragm response for a particular wavelength. And the circular diaphragm allows current materials to be used in sensors. Pentronics and also determine secondary structures of protein. So, over here, you see the CD response in protein and carbohydrates. Over here, you see the wavelength from 190 to 250 for this protein and from 160 to 200 for this carbohydrate. And also, the intensity is very low and the range is very low. So, intensity and wavelength is very, the range is very low. 
So the hot current can, can get a, a wider range of wavelength and also intensity. So we, we design or we, we artificially integrate them called metal materials. So metal materials are materials who do not have intrinsic chirality and they've been designed to have such kind of properties. An example over here is copper, and you can see the, the wavelength from 550 to 800 showing over here. And then to boost them, and also to boost them, a weak light, light water interactions compared to the organic and the biological molecules. So here, intensity and the wavelength have a wider, wider range. So now to have other part of hybrid nanohelices. So you realize that these better materials give a wide range of wavelength and then good intensity. So right here you can see silicon, silicon over here being deposited at this substrate and then followed by silver and followed by silver, silicon again. So this is hybrid. So you combine two metal materials and bring them together to investigate the properties. To investigate the properties. So right here, you see this diagram of a large over here. This is a J factor. So the J factor is more of like a CD response, but then it has been normalized to not consider the distance aspect of it. And I show you that this absorption depends on distance, but the J factor is normalized such that we understand the material without the influence of the distance. So you can see that how a wide range of response with a wide range of energy or wavelength over here. So in this research, we explore combining two or more metal materials hybrid have combined two or more metal materials to explore a CD response. And also, different combinations give different responses. So we understand why is that response happening, and then we know uh, which combination is better or which hybrid arrangement is better. And also, explore the response of perovskite, perovskite materials. So, more on perovskite. So, perovskite is a naturally occurring and abundant material. And this is the structure AVX3. Usually, A, B are cations and X is has a wide range of applications from sensors to batteries and to semiconductor applications. So, you see the structure by here. Okay, you bring them pair up. So, if you superimpose this structure on by this structure, they form that shape I described earlier. So, right here, you put the strength of chirality. And put a strength of power step to, to help design high performance of scalar electronics and spintronics. So when we get so when you take a power power step, it has a wide range of application from second harmonic generation, power electricity, per electricity, spintronic property, circularly polarized luminescence, and a circular diaphragm. But from the topic, we are focusing more on the Circular diaphragm response of the chiral perovskites. So it's a typical CD spectra of chiral perovskite. You see the range of the wavelength and the intensity. So perovskite gives a wide range to use from. And also, as I said, the structure of the ABX theory gives us a lot of room to explore different materials to understand the different structures or different hybrid helices we can see. So previously, this is the method that we been using chirality uh, in perovskites. They put the molecules through a chiral nanotube and then they get the chiral perovskite, or they attach ligands to the perovskite to form to make them chiral. But then the chiral perovskite cannot retain the chirality for a long time due to the stabilizers being used. Perovskite and the cell degrades rapidly, and also the stabilizers can't keep the chirality for a long time, so they lose the intensity over time or they lose their, their ability to. Uh, absorb the, the left and right circular polarized over time. And also, this kind of method do not have a close control of the dimensions and size of the chiral ligands. So, over here, in our group, we've demonstrated this um, model, demonstrated that we're able to have so much control on these number of helices, you're able to have control on the pitch, the size, the number of things, by having so much control over it and using it to prepare or design them. Chiral perovskite will be able to have so much control compared to the tablets currently being used. So, why is this of interest? Monohelices are optically active and to improve the photonic properties of the perovskite. And also, by having more control on the monohelices, you can make the perovskite suitable for specific band gaps and wavelengths. 
So this is the experimental model. So over here in 2018, they, they use gold nano rods and then they deposited biological materials over on it. So my plan is to use this rods or nano helices and deposit the per perovskite on it. And this is the plan. You deposit the per and nano helices over here, and then we sprinkle the perovskite on it. And we begin, we begin with the silica ammonium lead iodide. That is well investigated a very good active material for semiconductors. And I hope this expected result that we retain the chirality of the perovskite for an extended period of time because the nano helices are relatively rigid and have more control, right? And also increase the wavelength range and chiral signal intensity across all the wavelengths. So the intensity should be across all wavelengths and a wider range to be. So the future work is to explore more hybrid metal materials to investigate CD response and why are getting those particular response. And finally, um, and also investigate methods for preparing the chiroperoxide, chiroperoxide on the helices using spin protein or atomic, atomic layer deposition, among others, and also characterize the materials using TEM and similar other characterization methods. So thank you to John, Dr. Gibbs, and the whole Mirror team. Thank you. Okay, time for questions. Yeah, I'm right, uh, thanks for the talk. So you uh, right at the end there when you're talking about like your your future things. Um you mentioned like you want to explore more hybrid and materials and uh, to investigate CD response. What are you kind of looking for if you're looking at different materials? What what do you do with this? So I mean the different materials should give different CD responses. So we're to you know. Why such responses are happening, and then with them, the, the, the rate of rate of movement that also be, also be happening up then it's useful and it's useful applications in uh, sensors and other stuff. Another question? Yeah. yeah, would there be any benefit to using other non microscopy based techniques to kind of characterize these things or not necessarily? Yeah, so um, the goal is to um, so I, I use this to understand the, uh, the morphology and how it is. So obviously, we can explore other characterization uh, techniques. Are you focusing on trying to find the largest chirality, the largest G factor kind of thing, or tunability, or just cataloging it down? Because we do back up my next question. Like, what exactly are you looking for? Are you looking for the largest chirality, or are you looking for tunability? But you know, put the chirality, the G factor wherever you want it. I think with I really mean, the tune is also the, 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 the chirality, the intensity to being able to tune it and also the, the intensity of the chirality that are looking out of both. Combination of all factors. Any other questions? Now let's thank Philip and thank all the others. Thanks everybody for attending and we'll be here one more seminar next week. Yeah. <laughs>